And then you just let me know when you want me to change it. Okay. Or you can lean over, but it's easier to tell. No, I'll just yeah. fire. Okay. Deal. And let me just make sure because I have I'm streaming from here, so that's. Okay. 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 Thank you guys again. I cannot believe it's been a year since I gave this talk. Um, but of course, there's more and updated information on it. And I feel that it's just a talk that will be one that we have to repeat every single year because every single one of us. Um, are touched by cancer, whether it's in our pets or in our humans. Um, we all are dealing with it or have dealt with it. And most of the people who go on the great cancer quest um, of knowledge, like I did a few years ago, do so because they personally um, were affected by cancer. My nephew was diagnosed with metastatic testicular cancer at the age of 21, and he's doing very, very well but it did send me on the quest. And of course, I've always been interested in alternative cares, complementary medicine, um, since I was young. Um, that really propelled me forward to gathering anything and everything I possibly could find out to help him. And then of course, that just readily translated over into helping our pets. Uh, and the, the, the first thing that I talk about with cancer is that it is by far easier to prevent cancer than it is to treat it. So part one is how do we work on doing the best we can? You know, we're not gonna prevent everything, but how do we maximize the possibility of preventing cancer in ourselves and our pets? Because you can bet that this translates over into ourselves as well. Um, the second part of my talk next month is what happens when they get cancer. What do we do? What are some things that we can do? How do we maximize life expectancy um, and quality of life? So that's part two next month. Um, so we're gonna start with the rise of chronic disease. Um, so we talk about cancer as pretty much, and even in homeopathy thousands of years ago, in Chinese medicine, Ooh, sorry. It's, it's the end game. Cancer is the end game. Not necessarily, oh, you're gonna die, but it's the culmination of chronic disease that's been present for a long time. And so we may just acutely find out we have cancer, but we've chronically been ill. And so in Chinese medicine, it's called stasis, blood stasis. And so it doesn't just happen overnight. This is something that happens from imbalances that have, that have been lifelong for years. And it culminates in this end game of cancer. So why cancer is so very difficult to treat. So we see its rise not only with cancer, but we see autoimmune disease on the rise. We see chronic disease on the rise. And now if we include that, then we know that everybody is in contact with people that have chronic disease, patients who have chronic skin disease, multiple tumors that keep popping up. This is what we're seeing in our animals. And there's lots of people um, constantly researching from the Eastern, the Western, the holistic side of this. And there's a general consensus that we breathe, we drink, and we eat massive amounts of chemicals. And so this is absolutely affecting our life. Um, and so there are things that we can't avoid. We can't go around carrying our own oxygen tanks. We have to go outside and breathe the air. But there are things that we can do things about. You know, we can deal with our water quality. We can choose the foods that we want to eat so that we're not ingesting so many chemicals. Um, vegetables now um, are highly contaminated. Um, they're also splicing uh, pesticide genetic uh, material from the pesticides into our vegetables so that they're naturally pest resistant. So they get a higher yield of crop and a much lower nutrition rate. 
we are not taking care of our soil properly and so we are raping the soil and we're replanting and now all of our corn that we're getting or our vegetables our okra whatever it is from the grocery store is much less uh, nutrient nutritious for us so many less nutrients in it and so all of these things compounding over time us constantly having to detox our body is what leads us to this chronic diseases. And we're also a society of, we need things to be fixed right away. And so it doesn't help when we are needing medication right now that makes my dog stop itch, or I'm vomiting, I need to take a drug for that. And so we're a society that wants to suppress the symptoms instead of heal the body and then sometimes we take more medication because the side effects of the other medication and so forth. And then now we're, our liver is constantly being detoxed and, and or assaulted and we're constantly having to detox. So all of these things really lead us down a path of, yeah, it's quite obvious that we're a society that would have high levels of chronic disease here. Um, so our meat, um, I always like to talk about this. This is gross, sorry but we produce high volumes of meat. We take them to the slaughterhouse. They're killed, they're scared, and they have enormous cortisol release before they're killed. And then we eat that meat. And so you can be a person that believes a lot. For me, I, I'm an acupuncturist, so energy is huge with me. Um, and you can believe that that energy is transmitted to us. So that's one way to think about it. Or you can be somebody who's more scientific and less on the, the realm of energy and say, well, now I'm just ingesting a high level of a hormone. And the hormone is fight or flight. So cortisol can be very damaging to the body. So I just like to talk about where dog food companies originate. Sorry, I haven't read this slide since last year. Um, basically, it's a thing of convenience because we're busy prior to the origination of dog food it was whatever you guys ate we throw it out back and let our animals eat it and we were eating much healthier too and so our dogs were and our cats were eating pretty nice leftover meals but we've all shifted to a very very busy life and I'm and I see that so clearly most of you know I just brought my two Haitian daughters home and they live on island time, and everything is so laid back and slow there. And it's profound to me to see our life juxtaposed with their life, and now trying to incorporate their life into our life, and how we're on the move. Gotta get a soccer practice, gotta get a basketball practice, let's go through the drive through let's grab some food, let's throw the food down for the dog. Um, and throw some food down for the cat. And so we lose a lot with that. Um, and so that's why dog food companies became so popular. One, it was because um, it was a great way to make money because pets move from the backyard to the front porch to the bed. Um, so the pet food industry is multi-billion dollar industry because we love our animals so much. So it's brilliant to have gone down this road to formulate these foods. And along the way, there was an awful, an awful lot of bumps. Um, and we're gonna talk about a bump that we're recently facing right now um, in just a little bit that's very important to you guys to bring it to your attention. But the first big bump was heart failure in kitty cats and realizing that they were not getting the taurine that they needed. And so that was a big realization um, for the pet food companies to make sure that they were getting taurine so that their hearts um, had what they need so that they wouldn't fail. Um, there have been other bumps along the way, and like we talked about, there are bumps right now, which we're going to get into in just a little bit. Um, but one of the things that I always like to talk about is as this, you know, pet food company just uh, took off and became multi-million dollar industry. Uh, would you give me a paper and cut the AC on? I had somebody cut the AC on. Sure, I'm sweating up here. Uh, as it became a multi-million dollar industry, typically that coincides with quality because now people are getting in, involved with it and they're 
trying to figure out ways they can make more money, increase their margin, because that's what corporations do. And one way that they did increase their margin is that they started putting really low quality meat in it. Dead animals, deceased animals, euthanized animals. Um, it, is, it, is, it, it is legal for the pet food industry to put euthanized animals that contain sodium pentobarbital in the food. Tufts University just released a study on the levels of sodium pentobarbital in the food and actually busted some of the top food brands. Um, and Nova Eva, I was really surprised that those brands were on the list for having sodium pentobarbital. And the FDA comes back and says, okay, 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 so there's sodium pentobarbital in the food. What level is acceptable for our animals? So, so let's give a number that we're gonna let our dogs and our cats ingest safely. So that's kind of what we're dealing with with the pet food industry. We're dealing with, and I'm very, um, angry about it because there are a lot of companies like when I was in vet school science diet was a big huge push on us They bought us the stuff. They gave us the presents. They gave our dogs free food um, And so we got very little nutrition training whatsoever in vet school almost nothing um, I got into an argument with my professor over whole foods versus processed foods so we get little training, science diet crammed our, down our throats, and they make it even more convenient for us because now KD equals kidney diet, SD equals stone <coughs> diet, G, GD diet equals gastrointestinal diet. So they really dumb it down for us, and that's a shame. Yes? I have something to add to that. Yes. I found out that um, I was I had a Shiba Inu and she ended up having cancer, liver cancer. She died from that. But um, when she was younger, she had real bad allergies. So I was feeding her this Yukonuba, um special formula food mm -hmm. for dogs with sensitivities. Yes. Then I find out that in the ingredients of this expensive food was this chemical called epoxyquin. Oh, yeah. They don't tell you about that, but that they use it as a preservative and yeah. that is really toxic yeah. to your animal. Yep. Yeah. Absolutely. And it's in the in, I was in denial because I thought I'm paying all this money for this food. How can Absolutely. it be in there? Exactly. And then I happened to read the ingredients and there it was. And it's in people food too. And that brings us to a great point that is don't just trust me. Because even though I'm a watchdog for the animal foods, I can't be everywhere at once. So be your own watchdog and read the labels. And if there's anything you don't know what it is, just Google it. Oh, there are a couple of vitamins that have kind of a scary name. And you're like, oh, that might be scary. But it turns out they're usually B vitamins. Um, but any preservatives in the food, anything like this, is just something else that are, these animals have to detox. So they're detoxing a foxiquin. They're detoxing sodium pentobarbital from their body. So it's no wonder that they're having these chronic diseases. Um, the other thing, too, is just the processed food as opposed to the whole food. So, I mean, all of us, whether we do it or not, we all know instinctively that going home every night and eating a TV dinner isn't the way to go. It's not the best thing we should do for our body. And we certainly don't want to eat the exact same TV dinner every night. And so that's what we're asking our animals to do, is to eat this processed food every single day. And so when I started to branch out and learn about nutrition, and I started to feed my animals all the things, and they would run to their food ball and wag their tail, or my cats would meow and be so happy, it was like a whole new world for me. Because I was so excited, because I, I didn't drink the water or the Kool-Aid, but I was a vet student and I was poor. So originally, I will say my animals did eat. <laughs> they did. So, but it was great comparison for me to see my animals change from science diet, a food so poor quality like science diet, to something so rich and healthy and just watch them blossom and do amazing. So... 
The next thing is water quality. Um, unfortunately, we live in a very non-progressive state. Um, states like California, country like England, they use ozone to cleanse their water. And ozone is very powerful. We're going to talk about that again. Hopefully, I won't forget. Um, and it kills everything, viruses, bacteria, microorganisms, um, anything in the water it kills. And it leaves no residue for us. But here in Volusia County and the surrounding counties, we use very high levels of fluoride and chlorine. You can smell it when it comes out of your faucet, mm -hmm. the chlorine when it comes out of your faucet. And so this is another thing that's really toxic to our animals as well as us. So just briefly on water, Quality. Does anybody have? Oh, I'm sorry. It's okay. <laughs> Just, it's fine. You can turn it off. Um, does anybody have a diff uh, diffuser? A uh, water? Um, um, RO. No. I'm going to talk about that okay. in a minute. Does anybody have just a water filter on your sink? Good. Minimally, minimally have a water filter on your sink for yourself and your animals and change the water filter frequently okay. and then if you oh, want to gosh. cross over into an even more pure and wonderful form of water which now my family doesn't like any water outside of our house <laughs> it's called reverse osmosis water it goes through seven filters underneath my sink before it comes out and we use it exclusively for cooking and drinking now the problem with reverse osmosis water is that it takes everything out of the water and we don't want to drink the purest form of water because if we drink a lot of it that can cause problems so we want to add back a little bit of salt into the water but you can't add white table salt because that's a no-no as well so we use a hawaiian himalayan salt called premier salt that you can get on amazon.com it's a great salt and we put a pinch of it in our water so now we've got healthy minerals back in the water, but we've got the purest of the pure waters. Any questions about that? I don't think I touch on water again. Yes. Uh, okay, to do the pinch of salt with distilled water as well? Yep. Okay. Yep, if it's, it's a healthy salt. That's all our pets mm -hmm. or barbary grains, distilled water. The only downside of distilled water, and this is me being really picky, is that it sits in plastic. Well, yeah, but it's a speckled plastic. Okay, good. Then you're getting a yeah. good one. Yeah, that, that, that plastic is very different because it has to be just distilled water, so that's it. Yeah, yeah. Okay, ready? Okay, so going back really quickly to the veggies that we grow in the soil and what we grow as organic. And this, I, does any, do any of you guys go to, I'm going to forget, the, it's a farm, it's a local farm, and you can get a share on um, the ground. Common, Common ground, yeah. thank you. Yeah. yeah, wonderful, wonderful. Do you know why Common Ground started? Because he had cancer. Because he had cancer, yeah. So we're going in there, my husband and I, and we're getting our vegetables, and I look on the wall, and I have to take a picture of this because I'm, like, blown away by it. And I know it's hard to see, but it just talks about what is lacking in organic or conventional and what, like, for instance, my favorite was the magne magnesium. Most of us are magnesium depleted. If you have trouble sleeping at night, if you're constipated, you're likely magnesium depleted. Most Americans walk around magnesium depleted. Number one death in hospitals is that you're not getting enough intravenous magnesium and you have a heart attack. Um, so it's very high up on the scale. So we ride really low with our magnesium. So in snap beans, magnesium is 63 organic. And in the conventional is 14.6. And that's milli equivalents of that mineral. I mean, that's massive. Less organic 49.3, conventional 13 milli, milli equivalents. So I know organic costs more. And so there's some of you guys that can't afford to do all organic. So you can go to the dirty vegetable website and you can find out what ones you really need to do organic. And what ones you can kind of get away with them not being organic. So that's a really healthy one. Common Ground has an open market on Saturday. Yes, thank you. In the morning. I don't know. You can go and get the leftovers and you can get milk, fresh, unpasteurized and milk, and eggs and cheese. Little plug for Common Ground. Yeah, they're awesome. Local eggs. Local. 
chickens aren't done anything bad to. Yep, it's a great, great yeah. farm. Yep, that's where we shot it. And guys, I have a sign up over here if you want this lecture emailed to you afterwards. Yeah, I'll, I'll actually, okay. we're going to talk about some other things that should have been in here. I don't know what happened, but we'll figure it out. We'll figure it out and we'll get an email to you. So I'm just going to have to figure it out. Just talk. <laughs> I'm going to talk about it without a slide. We'll survive. Ask your question. I'm going to get back to this. Please. The euthanasia solution. Yes. They don't use that to euthanize livestock. So it's going to be coming from cats and dogs. From Correct. And I've called several companies because I'm like a crazy person. Yep. And, oh, no, we do not get our animal food from uh, animals that are euthanized. I said, oh, yes, you do. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, and also you might be talking to a front person who has no idea what the back people are doing. I actually had babes, babes, cat food, and dog food call me personally. Oh. And we went around and around. He said, I do not do that. And wow. and he was one that had a little higher ratings than some of the other ones. Wow. And coming school with veterinary medicine, yeah. I think they have the clinical nutrition newsletter. Yeah. And they tell you, don't read the labels. Wow. Of your food. <laughs> wow. Crazy. Yeah. And another deceptive tactic is they will say uh, no ground up euthanized animals added. And the key word is added, added. <clears throat> because if they're a bottler or a supplier, wow. you, 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 uh, they, the original manufacturer, they, they add preservatives, and then the bottler or the supplier. They say no preservatives or no dead animals added. added. But it's deception. It's amazing. All right, because it's not added. No, we don't do that, so we're technically telling the truth. Right. But the supplier has already done has it. has already done that. So yeah. the the people who take this ground up mass of animal tissue of euthanized dogs and cats and they put it in ovens and bake it and then give it sell it to you as mm -hmm. pellets, they they can truthfully say no euthanized animals or sodium technical added. But they don't tell you one step before in the supply Absolutely. Trade. It's all about mm -hmm. marketing. A lot of discussion. A little bit a little bit off topic. After my first wine runner died of adenocarcinoma, yeah. I was on a thimerosal kick. And my vet in Miami called Pfizer and they said no, there is no thimerosal in our rabies vaccination. She called me back a month later and she said, on my cell phone that's arriving in Connecticut, she said, you are so right. She didn't lie. He didn't lie to me. He said, we don't add it. Right. It's mm -hmm. already in the bedroom thing. Mm -hmm. Right. Mixed right. together. Did you guys hear that about the thimerosal? You can't yeah. trust anybody. So um, she was just saying that she had called the company a while back about thimerosal and the company said, Pfizer, yeah. said it's not added. But what was happening is it was being added prior to Pfizer getting it so that Pfizer could legally say it yeah. hasn't been, we have not added thimerosal to our vaccines. Right, that's the key yeah. word to key word. added. Yeah, yeah. more the same. Exactly. So it boils down to finding people that we trust or using products that we have made at home in a lot of ways. That's great. So I have any, I love, please, please talk up. I don't want to just talk at you all night. I love I to have your input. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you got to check the soil. I know. I know. <laughs> oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah it's it's right for her. Okay. Yeah. Um, so we'll touch on other things really quickly with the rise of, was that where I was? The rise of chronic disease in humans yep. and pets? Yeah. Okay, cool. Um, so we've got these contaminants. We've also got incredible obesity. Um, we are also eating this crappy food and drinking this crappy water, and our gut is constantly assaulted. We take a medication for any ailment. Um, that we have and our gut is quite assaulted. And I went to a lecture, now it's been a few years ago, and I'm completely astounded by a research project done that one dose of antibiotic, not a, not a full course, one dose of antibiotic affects the cat's gastrointestinal tract for greater than 200 days mm -hmm. if you don't do anything about it. So now we have these 
chronic allergy or chronic sick patients and we're giving them drug therapy to try to make them better, their gut gets worse and worse and worse. And now we start having collagen problems in the gut. We get what's called leaky gut. Um, and leaky gut then will allow proteins to slip easily through the intestinal lining membrane. And what's right behind the intestines are our immune system. And so our immune system is, is the, under this chronic antigenic stimulation. It's under attack um, because of the foods that we're eating. We also see a huge rise in emotional problems in our kids. Um, we see enormous amount of depression. We see ADHD. We can, this is a whole nother lecture. But we have to consider that these kids are eating crappy food, and we also know that our microbiome in our gut is closely tied, linked, and communicates with the microbiome in our brain. And so our microbiome is messed up. A huge part of our immune system comes from our gut. And so now we have emotional issues because our gut is affected, and we also have an immune system that's damaged because it's, it should be coming from a healthy gut. So it's just very depressing. Sorry, this is a depressing lecture. <laughs> no, wait, it gets better at the end. Um, so we kind of just spiral into this living with this chronic level of unhealthiness. Um, and so that's the same for our animals. All of us, all beings um, on earth, except the rabbit that only eats organic grass. <laughs> <laughs> that lives on an organic farm, right? <laughs> but most beings are assaulted by the chemicals. All beings are assaulted by the chemicals in the, in the world. Okay. Next. Oh, and go back. Okay, one more thing to touch on really quickly. More depressing news. What is stored in fat cells? Estrogen. Oh, toxins. S yes, toxins and estrogen. So now we have also, we're spaying and neutering our animals very young. And so we have these huge hormonal imbalances. And so that's a cascade that separate to everything else causes enormous amount of problems with our pets too. A lot of assaults on these guys. And we're expecting them to live longer and live healthier. And so we certainly have to help them be able to do that. Okay, so you can see what a healthy GI tract looks like. I have a dog walking in the door, or a cat walking in the door, a bird walking in the door. And I know that their GI tract is healthy because their fur coat is beautiful, their paw pads glisten, their ears are clean. There's so many cats that the only thing I've done to change, because cats don't usually get ear infections. They're not an ear infection species. But they'll get waxy, nasty debris when they're on a poor quality diet. And all I do is change them to a healthy food and their ears are so crystal clean and beautiful. And the owners don't have to clean them out anymore. So ears are clean, eyes are bright, there's no leakage from the eyes, the paws are beautiful, the fur is there, there's not excessive shedding, it's shiny, it's bright. So these are all signs that the gastrointestinal tract is likely very healthy or, or it's early in disease if the GI tract has disease. So we might see a puppy come in and the puppy's already trying to get sick and not doing well and still looks beautiful. That just means that the gut hasn't been assaulted so much that it's showing it in the skin. Because the skin's the window, right, to what's going on in the body. Did I get everything? Yep, no gas, good. Oh, another really important thing about the, the dog's um, and cat's diet is that we should, we're kind of programmed to feed them one food all the time. And so this is gonna be where I talk again about what's going on with the new research and um, the, the dog food, um, is that variety is key. Um, and it's key because we want to make sure they're getting everything they need. And we were taught a long time ago, find a food that works and keep them on that food all the time. Well, nobody wants to eat that. I mean, do you want to eat the same food every single? No, we, nobody wants to eat that. But also we're setting up our little dogs to get pancreatitis and gastritis because they're not used to getting different things. So variety is very important. 
We're also banking on the pet food company making exactly what you need and you need and you need. And that's impossible. Like there's no way that one food can meet all of our pet's needs. It's impossible. I absorb magnesium at a totally different rate than you do. Exactly the same in our animals. So we need to make sure that we're supplementing for them so that they are at maximum and optimal potential to live their longest and healthiest life. Let food be their medicine. There's actually in Chinese medicine a whole, um, in Chinese medicine we do acupuncture, we do herbal therapy, we do massage, but there's also a whole section dedicated just to food therapy. And so we'll treat a lot of conditions just with food alone. So food is important, food is medicine, and so when you come to Florida Wild with a sick pet, all you guys are here so you're probably already doing great, but when you come to Florida Wild with a sick pet, that's the first thing that we're going to talk to you about. Because I cannot give all the things that I need to give if you can't commit to me and do the food at home. So we have to work together as a team to get your animal feeling its best. Yeah, so variety is super, super critical. So what is the best? So now are we talking about the good stuff? Now it's not so depressing, I think. So what can we do about all this? What can we do about the assault on our pet's GI tract, about needing the variety? Well, whole food is best, 100%. And we're gonna get to hear just a few words from Charlie who opened up Rick's Dog Deli, and we partnered 10 plus years ago, probably? Not, not quite, long. not quite. Oh, seven. Seven, seven, seven years six, ago, seven. six or seven years. Feels like longer. Um, because he too saw what Whole Food did to his his dog, Rick, right? And he uh, wanted other animals to be able to experience that wonderful, healthy life. So with big dogs, it can be a little cost prohibitive. So it'd be very expensive. So what we just want is some of the Whole Food to be supplemented into the diet. And, we, and I really like to work in a Chinese medicine. We don't have to. I mean, you can do some meat and some veggies and see how it goes. But I really like to incorporate Chinese medicine into it. So if your dog is running very hot, um, then let's add some turkey. Let's add some cooling turkey. Let's do some celery, some watermelon. Let's cool your dog down. If your dog is very cold, not very frequent that we see that in Florida, but we still do see in stage dogs that get very cold or cats that get very cold. Cats typically can be a little bit more cold when they get older or kidney disease then let's add some lamb or venison. Let's add beef heart. Let's add things to warm them up. Um, and that's a wonderful way to balance them. And so we can work with you, but the key is gonna be variety. So if you're in the habit of eating your own food, make just a little bit extra for your animal and feed them whole food as well. Yeah, but they want meat, right? Who? Yeah, the animals. They do, but um, cats are car cats are more carnivorous than dogs. Dogs are yeah. lovely omnivorous yeah. species, so they'll like they'll do well with the vegetables. Although at the Chi Institute, for some of the hot cats, they will recommend doing like a little bit if they'll eat them a little bit of cooling vegetables. I eat it, but I don't cook meat, so. So yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> okay, and we don't want any chemicals or preservatives in the food. And brands that we love right now, right now, um, like I said, we're a watchdog for the companies. We'll take them off the shelf in a second. Um, Rick's Dog Deli, Stella and Chewy's, Dr. Harvey's, From, Primal, and Instinct. So those are some good brands that we approve. What about Roruva, which you recommended to us before? It's okay, yeah. Just okay? Because I thought it was fine. It's a canned food. Yep. So canned food for cats is better than dry food but whole food is better than canned food. Right. So Waruva ranks high on the canned food list, but it's not a whole food. It still goes through processing, and it goes through processing in Thailand. Um, have you heard of a company called TrueDog.com? Somebody gave me their um, website. website. And they're also on Amazon. Yeah, okay, and I, and I think that I looked it up a long time ago, but I don't remember what I found. Well, basically, they have organ meats and blood and, you know, liver and 
Is it to be delivered to you as the it's meat, freeze -dried. or is it no, no, no. made it's, as a diet? It's little chunks. It's freeze dried. Okay. It's very light. You could almost blow it because it's little okay. chunks, about a half inch chunk. They're very light, and I I mix it uh, one third that with one third uh, keto kibbles and one third keto salmon. Awesome. And so, and he's talking about, this is Dr. Zimmerman, who happened to be a, a friend of one of the people that I follow because he's brilliant. His name is Frank Schallenberger. Right. Um, he's a pioneer in ozone. And Dr. Forsyth, too. Yeah, and Dr. Forsyth. And so, Dr. Zimmerman and I love, and I love to have conversations about what, what he does, and I'm, I learn from him as well. Um, so, Whole Food, basically walk out of here knowing that Whole Food is best. And you're not a bad person if you can't do 100% whole food at all. If you can do some, that's awesome. It will improve your pet's quality of life more than anything I can do at Florida Wild. Okay? I mean, it's the single most important thing that you can do for these guys. And variety, variety, variety. And so recently, um, the boutique brand of dog foods like Fromm have been under attack from, and potentially rightly so, um, from the uh, research. Who originally, Dr. Hathaway, who originally published that study? I have no idea. Yeah, I don't either. Um, okay, so we're seeing some question marks. The FDA is working on, like there's a, there are FDA studies now that go more in depth with it. Right, so it, this, is a, this is unfolding right now, but it's very important to mention. So as I, from the moment I opened Florida Wild, I've been preaching whole food. But I've also been preaching change it, change it, variety, variety, variety. And this is why. They're saying that some animals, they think, that are fed a boutique food, like from, that's grain-free. They're thinking potentially lentils are the, the cause of it, but there's still a lot of question marks or binding necessary nutrients that the heart needs and causing early heart failure in our dogs. Golden retrievers um, have been popping up as one of the breeds of concern. So you have nothing to be fear concerned about if you're changing your proteins and your variety, um, then they're getting all the nutrients that they need. So we're kind of watching, and you can look for an email from us. We're going to put out an email just letting you guys know what we know. Um, but just just kind of be aware of that. Yes. I don't know if you know Pet Sewer. Yes. A friend of Susan, I think her first name is. She's like a watchdog for pet food. One of the things that I've been reading about, and I've noticed it on some cans, is canola oil being added to food. Mm -hmm. yeah. And that's kind of been questionable. Do you? Yeah. So canola oil is no, not good for you. It's not good for your pet. Yeah. Or any vegetable oil. Yeah. Or any vegetable oil. So um, the lovely thing about Dr. Harvey's, I really like, um, and Dr. Zimmerman and I talk a lot about this, is that you can make do, uh, Dr. Harvey's into a keto um, diet. And so sometimes, not always, not one diet is good for any single animal. But you may have an animal that would benefit from a keto diet with a cancer patient. And so we can manipulate Dr. Harvey's to be that type of diet. Because, of course, cancer lives off sugars. So we want to decrease, eliminate our sugars as much as possible. What about carrageenan? I think I'm saying it right. I buy the, but you know what? It's in Ben and Jerry's ice cream. Yeah. And it's, it's everywhere. It's yeah. sad. Yeah, mm -hmm. it's everywhere. Would you repeat what she said? The name is the Karagian. Is it Karagian or is it Karagian? Karagian. I've heard it said both Karagian. ways. Yeah, yeah, Karagian. Okay. Yeah. Um. Okay. Yeah. Awesome. Okay. So we're rounding out this lecture tonight with what are we going to do? We're already going to feed our animals whole food. We're going to help to heal the gut. The gut is where it's at. It's where the party is. We've got to get it taken care of before we do anything else. So we do that with food therapy. We do that with probiotics. Ideally, you're changing your probiotics up every six months so that they're not seeing the same type of bacteria entering their gut. We're changing it up. Um, the gut is comprised of thousands of micro, um, thousands of uh, bacteria that work together like a symphony to produce 
this amazing immune system and, and degradation and utilization of food. And so when it's at maximum capacity, all your microbiome is working together, then you're going to be super healthy. And we can do that quickly at Florida Wild too, because you may have a pet that's very sick and we want to replace the microbiome. Um, we're actually going to insert healthy poop into your dog's um, colon. And then hopefully that bacteria is going to take up residence. When we use probiotics, although they're wonderful, we're giving six to 10 species at a time. When we do a microbiome transfer, we're putting hundreds of bacteria back into the colon so we can do it quickly. Um, we love slippery elm. Um, if you've had a dog with GI issues or cat, we've recommended slippery elm. It's a bark. We use organic from the organic tree and it's wonderful and it takes the place of famotidine, Pepsid AC, omeprazoles. Um, these have been linked to esophageal cancer in humans, FYI, if you take them long term. And also, they decrease the ability for our bodies to digest and utilize protein. And if you're a cat and dog, that's really important. So we have a lot of clients that come from specialty practices, and they've been sentenced to a long-term um, antacid like that, and we know that their body is not going to be able to utilize the protein. So we try to convert them over to something else. We want to minimize all of our medications. As you guys know, we minimize the vaccines here. We are not a no vaccine clinic. We are simply a smart vaccine clinic. We give the vaccines when they need it as puppies and we check their titer level. Once their titer level is fine, they are fine for life. They don't need to have a titer again. However, we're not ready to say that yet because of the studies. So we do recommend titering every three years, particularly for those animals that are um, susceptible outdoor cats, dogs that are going to dog shows, dogs that are at the dog parks all the time. We still want to check that titer every three years to be safe, but there's a lot of information out there that says that even if our titers drop to nothing, if we're assaulted with that virus, that our immune system will kick in and it'll be just fine, even if our titer levels are low. And so to backtrack really quickly, titer levels are the amount of antibodies that we have in our bloodstream. So we measure it as a level to see if our animal is protected from the disease. Rabies, distemper, and parvo currently are the three that we um, are able to titer. And those are our three deadly ones, so those are very important for us. Um, we're also doing something new at Florida Wild, which warrants just a comment, which is, Previous to being able to titer in-house, we vaccinate for distemper a puppy and we send you on your way and tell you it's okay to go to the dog park. Um, but it may not be. So four weeks after our last distemper, we're having you come back in to check the, to check the titer level and make sure that we actually did our job and the dog did its job and it responded and the immune system is working so that um, we know that it's fully vaccinated and fine to go to the dog park and play. Uh, lastly, we use a metabolic analysis, which I'll talk about more and we balance the diet with yin and yang. So we talked about that, the heat, the cooling. We want to live our life balanced. I'm not a big fan of fad diets. I'm not a big fan of crazes. Everybody puts their animal on, just an example, of curcumin, and then few of them will come in and tell me, my dog's got diarrhea. Well, it's because curcumin is a very hot herb. And where it's wonderful for cancer and wonderful for inflammation, it's not right for everybody. If you've got a hot, constitution and you're giving yourself curcumin, you're going to be hot um, like my mom did. My mom got GERD um, from the curcumin that she was taking, um, or you can have diarrhea. So not everything is right for everybody. Metabolic analysis we do in-house. This is, for, for me, a culmination of a lot of years of research on trying to figure out what the optimal levels are um, and what it means when the animals aren't in their optimal levels. So we run extensive blood work and then we plug it into this formula, and we find out if they're functioning optimally. And if they're not, what does it mean? For example, um, it may mean that they need CoQ10. It may mean that they're running in a toxic level. It may mean that they need more magnesium, lecithin to their diet. So this is a way to find out, particularly for those of you who home cook, that the animals are balanced and that they are functioning optimally, okay? All right, food is our foundation of health. We want organic when possible. Whole meat, whole food is best. 
Probiotics are great. Metabolic analyses are important, and we use Chinese medicine. So the two slides that aren't in here that I'm going to touch on really quickly, um, two further ways to prevent cancer, because ultimately that's what this conversation about is how do we try and do the best we can to prevent cancer, um, is two more things. One is acupuncture and one is ozone therapy. And so we, we routinely use it when patients have cancer. But what a lovely thing to do before to try to prevent. And so what does acupuncture do? Acupuncture balances the body. So if we're living in balance according to Chinese medicine, then we're functioning optimally. So acupuncture can do quite a bit. It can balance the body temperature. Um, we can get deficiencies that it can help um, bolster. We can get excesses that it can help suppress. Ozone therapy. I'm just going to, I hate to do this, I'm going to read um, some things. I have this printed out for you guys as a list. And it's a lovely list for what ozone does. Because when I start to memorize this list of what ozone does, it's just too much. So ozone is O3, right? So at Florida Wild, we take O2, medical grade oxygen, run it through a little machine. It electrifies it. The O2 split up and reconfigure as O3s. It comes out of the machine as O3. We take it in a very special syringe. And in that syringe, we've got ozone. That ozone lasts for about 15 minutes before it degrades. Very unstable, doesn't want to stay in the environment. So what can it do? So I love this list on Dr. Schallenberger's website. So the first thing that it can do lovely for humans is that it's anti-aging. Um, the second thing that it does is it increases oxygenation of your cells. So when ozone is given, and we give it rectally, we give it in saline, in fluid therapy, we also give it intravenously, the O2, the O3 goes right in it, in a millisecond breaks down into O2 and O1. The O1 is a free radical. Now we all hear that free radicals are bad. But this free radical is actually good because this free radical stimulates a cascade of the immune system. So it wakes up the immune system. Cancer occurs because your immune system is sleeping. Cancer doesn't, cancer, your immune system doesn't see it. So cancer is forming in your immune system, whether it's walled off, whether cancer is very smart. The cancer just doesn't, the immune system just doesn't know it's there. And so what ozone can do is ozone can wake your immune system up to try to fight it. Ozone modulates your immune system. So that's kind of what we talked about, and it does so with that free radical. Um, but the, it doesn't stay a free radical for long. So it doesn't like bounce around the body causing damage. It binds very quickly to lipoproteins, and that combination institutes the cascade response. So ozone also increases the energy in your cell. It targets right to the mitochondria, um, which is a little engine in your cell. And so it, it penetrates right to the mitochondria and stimulates your mitochondria. It increases the activity of your antioxidant enzymes. And it, the ozone will reduce the oxidation levels in your body. Ozone reduces the level of activity acidity of your body. So we all went on the craze of alkaline water, right? We all heard that, alkalinize, alkalinize, alkalinize. Ozone helps to naturally do that. Ozone also kills everything that it comes in contact with as far as naughty organisms, bacteria, viruses. We're using it in combination with antibiotics and it is making our antibiotic therapy amazing. So there are patients that have to have antibiotics at Florida Wild. We don't just, we practice integrative medicine. When they need them, they need them. We just use it very cautiously. So we use the ozone therapy in conjunction with the antibiotic, and it's like a super antibiotic that's powerful. There are stories that perhaps we'll get to talk about next month of animals that we've saved um, with ozone. And then ozone, can't, ozone kills cancer on contact um, in dishes. Ozone kills cancer. So ozone is very powerful. Yes. Was, uh, the single oxygen or whatever you call it, is that the same thing as singlet oxygen? Singlet yeah. oxygen is O1. Uh, it's O1? Yes. So, all right, so I just want to make sure yes. they're the same. Singlet yep. is O1. Yeah, okay. singlet is O1. Yeah. And a very powerful free radical. Very powerful free, a good one, but it doesn't last long in the body. That's good to hear. 
Yeah, yeah. So, um, so ozone therapy, we don't use it in combination with antioxidants. So don't use an antioxidant on that day typically or space it out because we want the effect of the O1. Hmm. Very interesting. Okay, do I have any more? Okay, these are just some other things that we can eat. So if you're interested in further, want to further your uh, learning about pet food, um, there's some really good, um, there's a book, a Netflix article, and a website um, that's really good about pet food and what's allowed. Okay, cool. Any questions, anything I didn't touch on? I'll probably get to it next month because I know I can't keep you here all night. The list of pet foods you had, I yeah. know Prom says cat food, so I'm chewing. Do it. any of the other ones have cat food? Instinct has cat food. Yeah. yeah. Dr. Harvey doesn't have cat food, does he? Not that I know. Just dog, and they recently introduced bird food. So I bet you cat food is probably going to be close on the horizon, although cat food is really just meat. Um, is it? Uh, have I learned this correctly? If you want to determine the amount of carbohydrate in a pet's food, you take 100 and you subtract out the percentages of, of protein, fat, moisture, and egg. Oh. And the balance will be carbohydrate. I bet you that's about right. Although, even in vet school, when we talked about percentages, we were told to be very leery of them because they can definitely try and manipulate them as much as possible. But, but it seems like that yeah. would be a formula that would yield yeah. carbohydrate amount. Yeah, it, I believe it is. I, I have learned that, and I think yeah. there is a correct formula. 100 it, minus the protein, fat, water, and egg. I mean, that's... The and, rest of it. Yeah. And we want to stay away, good point, we want to stay away from ash in your cat food. So read your labels. We don't want ash. Ash literally is ash. Or, or, or fiber. Yeah. Or fiber. Egg and fiber. So, yeah. Uh, and then I don't think you mentioned uh, the, about the, the slide that said the rise of chronic disease in mm -hmm. humans and animals uh, corresponding <laughs> with the development of two things. Uh, Sugar and everything, oh, especially amen. high fructose corn syrup, amen. and any type of vegetable oil. Great point. So vegetable oil and sugar, a huge rise in chronic disease. And uh, overgrowth of yeast in our bodies. Shout out to Dr. Hathaway. Hey. Uh, <laughs> but, and that, again, it's assaulting the GI tract, and the GI tract is suffering, and then we're suffering from it. And we can cancer. Great, great, and then it's a great, great point. Yes? I cook a lot of uh, her food in uh, grapeseed oil. Is that bad? Yeah, grapeseed oil is actually safe for cats and dogs. Um, I prefer uh, coconut oil if you can, but it needs to be organic and unrefined and all that good stuff. Um, yeah, cooking, cooking it, yeah. Um, but again, you know, everybody went on a coconut oil phase and all of a sudden they're like, I got my animal on one cup of coconut oil, Dr. Holder, aren't you proud of me? <laughs> no, it's not for everybody. And that's why we do the metabolic analysis because we see what's right for your animal. Not one thing is right for everybody. So for just, if you guys will, any more questions, just a few more minutes. Um, Charlie's going to talk to us about Rick's Dog Deli. Um, and answer any questions that you have, and then you guys can get more wine or go home. <laughs> <laughs> the, Absolutely. The premium raw for cats that you've got down here is all oh, chicken. Yes. So you're there's saying, some fish in it. There's some fish? Are you, so, but you're telling me go get turkey or lamb and give it to my cats? Some, I mean, I have. Depends. And, Depends on what their constitution is. So we look at their constitution, and we see what they are. And so that's for a Chinese medicine trained person to see, to look at tongue and pulse. So we've already done that on some of my cats, yeah. but not all of them? Yeah. All right, so we're going to yeah. chat. Now. Yeah, so we can just do that. So tongue and pulse is incredibly important for us in Chinese medicine. Okay, thanks so much for your contributions. I think it was like the funnest interactive lecture I've given you. It was awesome. Okay, Charlie. Oh, Rick's Dog Deli, yay. <laughs> How exciting. <laughs> <laughs> yay, yay, yay.
Hi everybody, my name is Charlie and I uh, started Rick's Dog Deli about seven years ago on paper. Of course, it was in the making a long time before then. And uh, basically what we do is we uh, use human grade ingredients to formulate pet foods uh, on a breed specific nature, a therapeutic, na therapeutic nature, or any other thing that we think we can solve through food and food alone. We don't have any additives or anything of that nature. Um, so with that being said, that's our nutshell version of what we do. Um, but what I wanted to touch on a little bit was more about the food chain that Dr. Holder was talking about and how you have to be aware of what's coming into your house. And everything she said is pretty much happening out there in the market. And that is for USDA inspected human grade food. So we're worried about the quality of our food. Now imagine the quality of the pet food that is being given to your pets that have no voice in the industry whatsoever. So basically the way the system works, we all know this is money. So you can't sell your ground beef or your product or whatever it may be to a human. Well, you have to find another market for it or you're throwing it away. That market happens to be animals. And that's, so that's how the chain kind of works. So the quality of pet food is quite frankly disgusting compared to what you're going to find in human food. So I don't know how you would want to rank it, but on a scale of 1 to 10, maybe organics a 10. Our regular everyday food that we buy at Publix or even at a restaurant is going to be a, probably a 6 to a 9. Pet food is going to be probably a Thank 1 to 2, two <laughs> depending on what's in it. And um, we can touch on that a little bit, um, but that's not really why I'm here. I think um, I want to help you more with your individual animals. But one thing I would be very cautious about in pet food is anything that contains meal. And meal is a concentrated form of protein that is rendered down. So all the dead, dying, diseased animals, all of this stuff that they're coming in, um, that they're bringing in, is basically put into a giant pot. And this includes expired meat from Publix that has the styrofoam and the cellophane still on it. It goes into a giant pot. Water evaporates, they're left with a powder, a very high concentrated powder. So you get your high protein numbers for your labels. Pet food's extremely, it's, pet food's more about marketing than it is pet food. So now you have this label that everyone's concerned about. And I'll just use blue buffalo, for example, and they'll have deboned chicken as a number one ingredient. Well, uh, a pound of deboned chicken weighs a lot more than, it, than a little handful of this high concentrated protein. So they're going to put deboned chicken on that list first, even though it's not the main source of protein. And then the debone, and then the uh, the rendered down concentrate is really what your animal is ingesting for for a source of protein. So once again, someone mentioned that they, there's that plausible deniability where you can't uh, say, "Oh, I don't know. I didn't. I bought this from the manufacturer, and someone put this ingredient in there, and I did not know about it as the uh, as a, you know as a distributor." Um, and that's uh, that's something that that is almost uncontrollable out there, and you do have to trust your sources, which is where we come in. Um, Can you just touch real quick on byproducts, because I didn't do that either. Oh yeah. Just real quick, what byproducts are. Byproducts are anything that they can sell to a human. So if, you're, if you have a chicken, you can sell the breast meat, you can sell the bones for stock, you can sell the organ meat, um, but you can't sell the feathers, you can't sell the beaks, you can't probably sell the brains, anything of that meat, you can sell the feet, like yeah. the chicken feet. Yeah. Um, so anything of that nature, there's still a valued source of protein in there from a, from a numbers perspective. So they can take all those feathers and beaks and what have you and throw them in a pot. Once again, that's rendered down and everything that is vaporized is gone and you're left, left with this highly concentrated byproduct um, that they can put in their, number, put in their formulations to make their, their numbers look higher or to meet certain mineral requirements. And another thing that we can touch on briefly um, is with uh, the mineral requirements. And I'll just use a very brief example because AFCO is a standard out there and it's a self-governing body um, that I, quite frankly, don't have that much respect for. But, you know, well, hey, they're the 800-pound gorilla in the room, so let them do what they got to do. Um, but let's just remember this. You know, everyone out there on these websites will say, oh, your food needs to be AFCO certified. Well, Old Roy's AFCO certified. And who's in this room is going to feed their dog Old Roy? There's not one person. So for that, AFCO loses a lot, if not 100% of their credibility with me. Amen. 
Yeah, so uh, our food now, for example, we can stamp AFCO on there if we wanted to. We meet the requirements, um, which are very, very easy to make. Uh, um, but we just haven't really ventured down that path yet because as the owner of my business, I don't know if I want to. Um, if, I, if I think if I'm doing that, I'm kind of selling out a little bit in a way. So we haven't decided if we're going to use that as a standard or not yet. Right now we follow the standards of the National Research Council, which are a little bit more updated. AFCO did just update their standards. I think they're starting to catch on and realize people are just not listening to them anymore and they're, they're not they're not paying attention and the numbers and sales are, are reflecting that. Yeah. Uh, has the Cochrane collaboration done any work with pet foods? Uh, you know, the Cochrane collaboration is that uh, independent uh, group of scientists who does uh, meta analysis on, on randomized control trials and publishes the results. I have no idea about that. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. You can just go type Google or YouTube Cochrane. Sure. C H R A N E. Yeah. Institute or collaboration. Yeah. Group collaboration. I mean, there's a billion different groups out there that are doing a billion different studies. Funded by who? And I don't know. Um, things that we try to tend to pay attention to, um, there's one Can Candid, there's one out of New York City, which is affiliated with Mercola, who mm -hmm. I kind of really yeah, like. Yeah. Um, uh, there's Keto Pet Sanctuary uh, in Austin. They're good. dying yeah. to get there. I, yeah. I got to get there and go see them. Um, so we, we take all of those things into consideration, but that's, once again, that's almost a little bit out of our league mm -hmm. where we are... Um, you know, we, we are providing a service, and yes, our foods have been, of course, researched 100% and everything, but um, um, we're not a research group. You know, we're going to say, oh, well, um, you know, papaya is good for uh, pancreatitis, so let's put papaya in our GI formulation. That's mm -hmm. the, our, more of our approach of things. Um, although, yes, all, all of our food does get sent off to a, a lab for analysis, but... Um, um, the food that we use every day for our pets is the same food that you guys use. So if we suspect that there's a problem like pancreatitis, we're going to put turmeric in there. We're going to put, you know, some coconut in there to get some fats in there, but they're medium chain fats. So it's a little bit different. Um, and we as a company um, have basically 11 different formulations um, that cover a variety of the majority of problems that are associated mainly with the commercial diet of pet food, um, but we also can customize the diet for um, So for example, a um, uh, dog that's going to have kid kidney problems, renal problems, um, we're going to want to use the low phosphorus meat. The lowest phosphorus meat commercially available would be beef or beef heart. So um, now say your dog is allergic to beef. Well, we can use that same formulation, but use chicken or turkey or goat or something of that nature to get your dog almost the best that we can, or to get your dog the best that we can do within those parameters. Mm -hmm. um, and that customization is, I think, where we can really, or we really do gain our edge and we really can show you what we can do um, because you will see results 99% or 99% of the time we're gonna nail it the first time. Every now and then we get one that comes back that just we can't get our hands on and it takes a while. But um, um, the majority of that, I believe, is first of all, we're using quality ingredients that you and I are all exposed to on a day-to-day -day basis. We can't do any better than that. I wish I could say I could do everything organic. I can't, we can't do it. We have 330 million people in this country. We can barely feed them as it is now. We can't, it's just not possible. So we take the best of each group that we can get and we use that. Yeah. Um, and of course, all of our food is bought from uh, sources where humans buy their food. Cisco, Cheney Brothers, Harvest Meats. So if there ever was something in that food chain that's bad, there's a liability issue. So these companies are gonna jump on it and they're gonna recall like they do if there's a beef recall. They recall a half million pounds of beef because one tiny container had salmonella in it. Well, but there's human lives at stake. So there's a liability issue. Unfortunately, with pets, pets are property. So it's only a property issue. So that concern of, get, of action is not necessarily there for the pet food companies. And we actually have seen that very recently with Science Diet, 
who was not proactive in the re recall at all and probably no, cost a lot of lives. Yeah, yeah. And it's not just science. And I hate yep, just to pick on science yep. diet. It's just, it's everybody across it the board. Is, yeah. yeah. I mean, basically all your pet food comes out of two or three plants in the United States. Um, and they just, you know, I, I could send my formulation to one plant and then Hills would send their formulation to the same plant. It all comes out of the same, the same factory. Um, so that's how we work. Do you really make dog food? I'm sorry? Do you just make dog food? Yeah, yeah. Why? For now, why? We're not cat food. Because oh. we're busy enough <laughs> with the dog. <laughs> well, but we try. And we try we do, to do we, cat food. We, cats are just... Well, cats are very tough. Are and they're strict wonders. carnivores. So, in theory, there's not much to make. You know, we can make we can make a well, thing of chicken cat, for you. I have a kidney cat. He's okay. Either I think he's third stage renal. He's supposed to be eating science diet. My vet and I go around and around over this. He won't eat it. Of course, he won't tell you something. Any flavor. So I say, right. I'm not going to starve my cat. I'm going to give him what he wants to eat because otherwise he's going to lose weight. So you were talking like kidney diet. Why is he dog. losing weight? Because he won't eat the food. He's also losing weight because he's losing protein in his urine. I can't and so we him. can make the beautiful blood work with science diet, which limits our protein because that limits the phosphorus as well. But they're losing protein in their urine. And so what a crappy way to live. We won't eat the food. Of course. So you feed them very healthy protein and we monitor the phosphorus. I'm a pescatarian, so he does. I do not make chicken or beef in my house. But when I make cod or salmon, he eats. Good. Um, you can make cat food. Or, <laughs> trust me, <laughs> it's on the list. But the short answer, or the short answer to your problem is cat food is insanely easy. First of all, they're this big, so they don't eat a lot. And basically, if you've got like a chicken or a uh, leg, leg quarters for 70 cents a pound or whatever, I no, I can't. He won't. Oh, you won't eat. You, all yeah, right. It's hard for me all to right. even feed them canned food because I call us and we'll sell you a pound of ground. Chicken. Ground uh, tur or chicken thighs and see what we get. Um, of course, with cats, taurine supplementation. And this, I am not. I am speaking out of my expertise here. But taurine supplementation, and I believe there's some certain enzymes that you're you're missing if you. Uh, taurine is high in thromine. Yeah, and there's some other ones that you can add back. Um, because when you bake meat over 180. Oh, if you bake it here. Yeah. Yeah. If you, yeah. yeah if you cook it. it has you're to cooking. be raw. Cats are. I think uh, we would. Are they almost better at a raw yes. diet? Yeah. Mm -hmm. I love raw for cats. Yeah, yeah. That's, that's, that's a whole other conversation. That's a whole other cats. conversation. Yes. We cook everything yeah. to human grade standards. We follow HACCP standards, which is basically your restaurant standards, meaning we don't cross contaminate stuff. Everything stays refrigerated for the you know prescribed amount of time, or, or all of those standards are strictly followed um, in our in our quality chain. So it's um, it's. Almost impossible. Uh, we have a place in Orlando, yeah, over on Corinne Drive, but not for long. We are moving to College Park. But he drops the food off orders yes, here. Yes, we can drop off here. orders well, we here. Food, so. We do actually. We have premium raw food that for cats. Good for him. I mean, from him. Oh, no, no. It's, it's a raw formulated food. It's a raw in a bag formulated food. I ha and in all honesty, my cat eats the dog food, and he just picks out the rice or whatever. <laughs> you know, he just leaves it, and that's fine because he he. He's the same way you were saying. He just does the whole, you know, nuts so thing yeah. when you put food out. And yeah. if you leave him this dry food out, he's mad. He's pissed. Yeah. And we travel extensively, so sometimes he gets that dry food, and he's oh. mad when he comes home. <laughs> yeah. yeah, but um, yeah, um, uh, we we believe in cooking everything, and we've run studies on the meats and everything, and the bioavailability of cooking and non-cooking, and the risks of non-cooking far outweigh. I mean, we're talking, we lost like 1% of the nutritional value between cooked and uncooked. Yeah. So to us, it's not even a concern. But salmonella and all of these things that come in, your commercially processed meat, and even your organic meats, there's a huge risk there, especially for your animals and your compromised... It's less of a risk for animals. Animals yeah. can usually tolerate it well, but what happens is it's left on the counters, and then yeah. that can be a real problem for the human. So whenever we talk about raw, if it's not dehydrated, we do have a conversation about what, what, how to clean and take care of um, your kitchen. Yeah, yeah. The whole point yourself. of cooking is just to kill off that bacteria, and also, in contemporary American society, the way food is manufactured, for lack of a better term, or grown, um, they use these they, even in organic meats. They're dipping that stuff in chlorine before it goes off the processing. Well, how do you get rid of it? There's only one way to get it out, and that's to bake it off, and it evaporates and goes away.
So we've got, you know, arsenic is another one that, they, that is commonly used in, uh, um, as a, in chicken. And uh, yeah, we can bake that. I think arsenic evaporates at 200 and some odd degrees or something. I mean, so in theory, it should go away. Um, but that's another reason that we advocate cooking everything. And it's just, it's just a safer, easier way to do things. If we lived here and we're having this conversation 200 years ago by candlelight, I would probably recommend a raw diet for your animal. But things have changed in the last few years. And that is our job as a company, is to navigate those things for you. We look out for recalls on human grade food. We are on the lookout for where to buy vegetables from. And we can score them from California or Mexico or places where our buyers say, hey, these are the good places to get stuff from. Then that's our way of getting the best stuff we can possibly get in contemporary American society. We were on a farm, it'd be a different story, but if we're not, we live in a, in a regular city, you know, nine to five jobs, we're busy, we can't grow or be expected to grow or even cook our own dog food at this point. Um, everyone's just too busy. So our job is to help you guys and the doctors figure out a food solution that's gonna solve your dog's issues if your dog has an issue. Hopefully there's no issue and everyone's just happy. And you know, like my dog, he comes and sees you once a year and you say, he's fine, come back and see me next year. Yeah, yeah. and he actually gets all of the leftovers every day. So talk about an unbalanced <laughs> Variety diet. is wonderful. Yeah, yeah. Which, may I just segue into one last thing. Um, there, I had a real aha moment when I was at the Chi Institute learning about diet and I preached to home cook for your food animal that was before Rick's Dog Deli. Um, for years, and there was always a little bit of a devil on my shoulder worrying about balancing the diet and everybody yelling at me, balance, balance, balance. And I was just recently at a lecture, and she said, hey, nobody, if, not even the pediatrician asked if I balanced my kid's diet. That's right. And the reason that they don't is because they assume that you're feeding a variety to your kids. So going back to harp on variety, 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 if you feed variety, you're balancing their diet just fine. Um, and then we help you further that with the metabolic analysis. And once, not to keep ripping on pet food, but once again, look at the quality of the ingredients that they're putting in that food. So they're basically taking a food and extruding out everything that's alive in that food. And then they go to China and they buy the cheap vitamin D, or not vitamin D, vitamin Bs and whatever else they have to put in there, in the minerals, to meet the AFCO standards. But that doesn't mean your dog's uptaking them. I mean, if they're junky, minerals and they're not chelated properly and they're not going you're, you're they're going right out of your system so you're just paying for nothing so once again these standards that they have need to be taken very loosely um so one thing that we do do watch um strictly though is calcium if you are going to home cook for your dog make sure you're giving a bone or calcium supplement and if you guys need any help with that feel free to call us or i'm sure you because it, it over time we're not talking if you cook one meal don't worry you cook for a year maybe even a little longer before you're going to notice any calcium yeah. issues yeah so that's just one thing to, to be uh conscious of but everything else in home cooking kind of takes care of itself um a good rule of thumb is just use vegetables of different colors Obviously, if you have a question, if a vegetable, the rainbow. yeah, and you know, obvious, there's obvious ones, you know, you don't want to give a dog an onion or chocolate. Um, avocado is a great food for dogs. So don't give them the, the seed or the bark from the tree, but the flesh of the plant itself is great. Except um, for the ones that are recalled now. Yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, there's so many recalls out. I think someone mentioned dates, that they had dates on the phone. I talked to Dave. They even had a recall, didn't they, just recently? I think so. It's Salmonella, I think it was. Yeah, and yeah, I mean, there's just no way... The only way you can get that out of your food is if you use, if you irradiate it. And once again, I don't think we're solving any problems by irradiating food to kill salmonella. So once, just use your oven. <laughs> That's I get what it's there for. reports on my email alerts, and it's scary what is being recalled on a daily basis. Less than right. Yeah. It's, it's scary. Yeah. Food for us, food for pets, yep. medicines. Yeah. It's, it's yeah. Crisis. See, that's we have that little bit of a safety net where, you, since everything that is in that door comes in that door is human grade, someone else that is a human is out there eating it, and if they get sick, that person is going to sue whoever for ten trillion dollars. So yeah. there, there's a little bit of more urgency than it is, and I, I'm just absolutely kind of disgusted by the way science guy handled things yeah. with this last one. I mean, they really kind of just try to blow it off, and that's just, I mean. 
being what they should have done, in my opinion, is they should have stood up, manned up, and said, "We're the premier brand. You know, we're, we're you guys are paying us a trillion dollars for this dog food, and we made it. We screwed up." And instead, they did the opposite. Didn't even pick up the phone with customers and calling them. And uh, that's just unacceptable. So why do so many vets push science side? Because that's what we're taught in vet school. It's easy. Um, I didn't learn all that I know now in vet school. Um, science diet comes and wines and dines us, and they give us KD for kidney diet, and it's easy. And it's yeah. one less thing to learn. And we're all the same way. Too, it's right? all the same. I had one this today. Um, I had a customer come in, and a, that customer referred a friend to us, and the customer and the friend went to the vet, and the vet said that. Uh, the dog had crystals in the urine and that it was caused by our food and they put the dog on take, took the dog off of our food Yay! and put the dog on our rd kibble so not only are they putting them on the crap food but now they just took all the moisture out there right. and why would they make that decision i can't answer that but my yeah, thought would be because the science diet yeah. company yeah, yeah so and we're not knocking on vets yeah and this is a lot of learning i did I mean, it's not, I'm not knocking on them. That's just what they know. That's yeah, what I mean, yeah. trust me, they're a good yeah. company. I, I met the creator of Sci the Science Diet brand. I met, oh, the guy, than me. I met the guy that built it out. <laughs> he's, he's a smart guy. There's probably not another man on the planet that knows more about pet food than this guy. Yeah. And we uh, were interested in talking with him. And thank God we didn't go any further. But um, what I learned is he, yeah, he knows a lot about pet food. But it's more about the marketing of pet food for this and that and the other thing than it is behind. There was no, when they approached us, there was not even actually really conversations about our ingredients, what, quality. what the quality. quality. And it's it was, all about being able to produce in mass quantities and market it and make it profit. And make it yeah. look. Things where they cut the corners where they can get away with it. It's Absolutely. Not the same. Like, yeah. yeah, there's science behind their diets, but it doesn't mean that they use all the best things. Yeah. Yeah. They, yes, absolutely. They're, they have done some decent things for the animal world. Let's give them some credit for that. But yeah, at the end of the day, when the accountants come in and start running things, quality can and um, get hit with that. And I that. I'm set, or we are doing four pounds. Um, if you haven't noticed, competition company, Just Food Company, started in California, right around we did. Um, but they are now moving into Petco's, and they're going to have kiosks mm -hmm. or the kitchens in some Petco's. Um, and I'm interested to see how this is going to work, because I, I see them being able to give the consumer a much better product but I don't see any knowledge behind that product. So if you as a consumer are walking in there, I think you're gonna overlook their food. Um, and at the same time, they're about 20 or 30% more expensive than us. Nice. Yeah, so um, we welcome it. I think it's a change and it's a for geographical reasons. Uh, we would recommend that they go see um, someone similar to us for sure, than, than a pet food. We try to, it, there's one pet food that I like, and it's Halo, and that's because they don't use meal. Yeah. 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 Otherwise, I'm scared to death of everything else yeah. out there. Um, but yeah, long story short, we are a full service dog deli too. So if you have any questions, feel free to give us a call. We'll try to answer them. If we cannot answer them, we'll try to figure out who to talk to to get the answer. Um, if you have any special situations that you want to discuss, tell us through the web. We can try to help out your situation here. And that you come up with. Will you emulate a recipe if you want to cook it yourself? Because we know you're going to go cook it and you're going to say this is a lot of work and you're going to come back and buy our food. <laughs> so it works every time. But yes, if you need any assistance with anything like that, that's what we do to help. What is your company's name and phone number, please? Rick's Dog Deli. I got a card. Oh, okay. We've got brochures too. Yeah, and I got some, I got some oh, yes. little brochures back here. I'll, I'll grab you one if you want. Thank you, Thank you guys. Oh, okay.